India announced that there's going to be a TV program hosted by this guy who was jobless at that time. His name was Amitabh Bachchan. Mm-hmm. How went my dreams to be a quiz master in this country? I mean, how do you compete? Forget then. Mm-hmm. I'm talking 20 years ago. Today, if I have to start, I can't compete against Amitabh Bachchan. That is Amitabh Bachchan for you in India. Hello and welcome to the Nails and Hammers podcast. Our guest for today is Giri Bala Subramaniam, who is the CEO of Grey Caps and is one of India's most celebrated quiz masters. In this episode, we talk about Giri's education and what led him to enter into this niche domain of quizzing and start a company called Grey Caps. I hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as I enjoyed talking to Giri. Hi Giri, welcome to the Nails and Hammers podcast. I like that line. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to get nailed or hammered. Well, let's see. I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll just put our hands together at the end of the session. <laughs> so I want to start from the very beginning. Uh, can you share with us a bit about where did you grow up? Where did you do a schooling from? Uh, life has been largely for me, uh, Bangalore based in the early part of my growing up. So I, I grew up in Bangalore. I went to a school called Baldwin Boys. It's a very popular school in Bangalore. By popular, I don't necessarily mean in terms of popularity. It's a very established institution. It's a 1880 institution. So it's seen the test of times. It's been one of those flagship institutions of Bangalore's history and legacy. And there have been some iconic people who've passed out of that school. So I was extremely fortunate to be educated in a school like that. I was right through Baldwin. So in Baldwin language, that would be called a true blue Baldwinian. Mm -hmm. So that's really what I was and my entire schooling was there. And perhaps a large part of what I am today is thanks to my school. Mm -hmm. So I probably owe a lot of it to the grounding that I got at Baldwin. So that's where my schooling was. And where did you go for college? College was a mix of colleges um, over a period of time. I moved from a typically English-speaking, so to say, school to a completely Sanskrit-speaking Gandhian institution called National College. And uh, that is where I graduated. I pursued pure science during those days. Very, very humbling experience at National College. Again, a hundred year plus institution. At that time, we were very fortunate. We were led by or mentored, if that is a better phrase, by a person named Dr. H. Narsimaya. He is arguably one of the best educators India has ever had. Phenomenal man of science, extraordinary thinker, complete Gandhian. So he brought in a lot of these aspects like humility, etc., into the institution and rubbed off on people like us. You're sitting in the U.S. and I, I still remember we used to have people who used to teach math and so on. They were double doctorates from Stanford and they used to wear a dhoti and come and teach us math. So it was purely that depth of knowledge that got underlined and not how you project yourself. So I think those were very profound grounding years for me even before my career took off in any manner or in any way. So I I really think I'm thinking back, very fortunate to have had a mix of both. Baldwin's gave me a very different grounding, language, vocabulary, articulation. All of that is probably something I owe to my school, confidence, courage. While National College taught me what life is, how success should never get to your head, how failure should never deter you. These are the kind of things that National College taught me. So to me, my graduation was more my values education, Mm -hmm. Uh, the complete grounding of a personality and how to approach life, I think came from National College. I was also very actively into sport and stuff like that. So National College facilitates that in a very big way. National High School is famous, of course, for producing some of India's greatest cricketers. So they're all part of, luckily I've been part of two legacy institutions. And then, of course, life takes you. I went and did a PG in Delhi, and I became a media professional. Uh, so all of those things continued, but these would be the the basic foundational institutions that kind of shaped who I am. Mm-hmm. Did you do quizzing while at school or college? Oh, big time, yes. I mean, the 
the whole uh, passion and I, I strongly feel quizzing is a passion you you rarely find people into quizzing as a as a frivolous pastime they either get hooked to it very deeply or they just get away from it saying this is not my cup of tea there are no middle pathers when it comes to sports like quizzing quizzing chess all these are what i would classify as intense sport mm-hmm. it requires you to be part of it it's like certain academics are intense you can't be a doctor without being intense you you got to get medicine right you can't say i'm just doing medicine you know it's not possible so quizzing started early for me and i gravitated into it and that's really what happens to people i've always believed quizzing as a sport has a gravitational force and it sucks you in you would be a classic example i mean you're one of those who got sucked into that system it's Then extremely start, competitive to be honest in your era yes not mine to be honest i mean we two eras apart and uh, thankfully i've been facilitator in your era and not tested uh, but in our days it was more normal extracurricular activity like any other in most schools it still is at a younger age it still is it's, it's not as competitive at at a college level like a tata crucible or something that you would be referring to which is i keep calling as the wimbledon of quizzing so when you get to a wimbledon kind of a level it does get competitive but at a school level it was still fine so the passion for quizzing did did start at school the quizzer woke up at school so did the quiz master actually because i did my first quiz as a quiz master when i was at school so both the institutions played a very large role in quizzing interest subject based quizzing interest grew actually at national college uh, the national college has something to this day called the science forum and uh, the science forum of national college actually does a lot of quizzes and uh, all of these were exposures which led to greater interest that's really how one led to another it wasn't a planned path at all and so when you graduated from delhi uh, you joined times group so what did you do there at times group i was in marketing there was no sight of any other career in my mind at that time i knew that i was articulate mm-hmm. uh, so i did an mba which basically was with a focus in media and uh, it was only at delhi when i was part of these programs that i started knowing that there are these specializations in media and i took it up mm-hmm. i did join i played various roles and because i came from a media institute we were more like what is let's say a, a crude example would be uh, the program that i did uh, was perhaps a times of india equivalent of what a tata administrative service to the tatas would be mm-hmm. you know it's like a pass program and uh, you get put through different departments mm-hmm. so i wrote for a while and then i sold paper door to door for a while that's core hardcore physical paper marketing and then i was on the advertising side selling advertising space eventually i moved in and became part of managing the brand so i i became part of the brand team and uh, there were two or three brand teams uh, because times of india in that era that i'm talking about and uh, if i had to put a rough time timeline to it i'm talking of roughly around 94 uh, 95 and those were the days when times of india was aggressively launching itself in different uh, cities Uh, otherwise times of india in those days was restricted to two or three cities and uh, the economic times too was growing uh, navbarat times was growing so there were so many of these brands which were growing so my job was actually to be part of a team which used to launch these brands in different cities so we were actually called a brand launch team so i handled the launch of economic times in chennai and then i was transferred briefly to pune i did some work there and then i came to bangalore Bangalore was relaunching the Times of India so i would take credit with being the first ever brand manager to have launched a newspaper that carried color every day in india oh. otherwise color was restricted to weekends mm-hmm. and our daily newspapers were black and white so we launched the color edition so it was very exciting to see a color press being put in place we had to do months and months of trial runs so every day in the press in those days we used to actually print two sets of papers a mm-hmm. color output and a black and white output because one was for the market and one was testing oh. so enormous amount of learning mm-hmm. and i think 
newspaper marketing is a fascinating business to have been in because uh, it's a product where the lifespan is two and a half hours. It's like milk. At 8.30 in the morning, in those days, the life of that day's newspaper was over. Now it's probably even, even more or less uh, in, in terms of lifespan, unless it's an analytical paper. Mm-hmm. So very challenging, very, very challenging business. It, it taught us supply chain without using those jargons, but we learned supply chain and so on. Mm-hmm. So Times of India was a great learning experience. You also acquired your pseudonym of Pet Brain while at Times Group. So what's the story behind it? Uh, Yes, I did. Uh, So it was again part of launching various papers and launching various engagement columns within that paper. One of the amazing things that Times of India has done, and probably they're not credited as much for it, is they were the ones who came up with this idea of newspaper in education. Mm -hmm. And they started launching a separate set of pages to inculcate a reading habit in school children. And that was called the NIE page. Mm-hmm. So content had to become child-friendly within a normal newspaper. So there was a separate NIE team which was working on the content for children. And those days, we didn't have any crowdsource model. Today, mm-hmm. children write in those pages. Those days, we didn't necessarily have active children writing. So we had to write things that children will appreciate. And one of the easy things was a quiz column. And I figured, I mean, as always, budgets is a problem in any company. Oh, and you're not sure when you're going to click. So they said, hey, Giri does regular quizzing, so why don't we get Giri to write the quiz column? So I got roped in and uh, I used to contribute questions. But before the launch happened, suddenly we realized that the editor said, you can't write the name Giri there because you're not part of the editorial team. Mm-hmm. And that's how Pick Brain was born. Because I required a pseudonym to you know sign off those columns. And yes, I guess it stuck ever since. Mm-hmm. And then you joined Disney. So what did you do at Disney then? So Disney to me was absolute fun. And I think Disney was what made me probably eventually, if I borrow a metaphor of something like a Steve Jobs, then uh, uh, Disney was probably what made me realize that uh, knowledge can also be entertaining. At Disney, they take everything so seriously to be entertaining. So they're very seriously into fun. That's a nice way of probably describing Walt Disney. And that is where, while I was part of marketing and brand and we were launching different brands and so on, coincidentally, that was the time when we launched ESPN in India. Disney still owns ESPN. I mean, few people, quizzers would know that. So I was part of that launch too. And there were a lot of launches Disney had planned and they saw me as a launch expert. So I was roped in and the role was pretty much the same except that I wasn't launching print and I was launching television. So there were a host of channels that got launched in that period that I was part of. Uh, There was Hallmark, there was Kermit. And uh, Disney, aligning with my career currently, definitely taught me how knowledge could be entertaining. And uh, not to take anything away from any of those people who were doing quizzes in those days. Quizzes in those days was purely for quizzers and not for an audience. So it could tend to be boring if you're not deeply into it because they wouldn't even understand. It was deep science, questions would be one page long. So, you know, sometimes it became a purest kind of a game. And Disney made me realize that anything that works well, works well with the audience who are not taking part, enjoy it. Why is sport so popular? It's because people who watch enjoy it as much as the people who play. That's important for any successful concoction. So I would owe the genre of cuisine that we do entirely to my learning during the Disney days. That's a great analogy because for someone who has never been part of a quiz competition, they're overwhelmed about, you know, how how would they fare and stuff. But if if they see an entertaining event, they'll probably participate the next year. Yeah. And you, you had a really successful career at Disney. What made you enter into a niche domain like quizzing? Tough call. It was a very tough call. There were personal reasons for me to pursue it. I actually had a near-death experience in 99 and I was almost gone. And that drove me to 
probably ask myself uh, during those days, what if I had gone? What would I have not done that I would have wanted to do with my life? And I guess one of those was probably to do what I would have enjoyed, which is, you know, quizzing and stuff like that. And by that time, it was not a, the business decision probably was triggered by the the health fluctuation. Uh, But by then I had seriously started doing quiz shows on weekends and stuff like that. So there was a lot of evidence that there is a possibility and I was thoroughly enjoying it. While Disney probably is one of the best jobs that I've ever been in as a proper career, because Disney itself was extraordinarily engaging and, you know, stimulating to the mind. I was looking forward to every weekend because almost every weekend we were doing quiz shows. And uh, in a sense, therefore, it was a combination of both those things which prompted me to take the plunge. The scenario also kind of opened up at that time. That was the time when the dot-com world was opening up. So I came up with this thought of a portal where I thought, you know, the whole world would come and pay and play you know, quizzing online. And uh, the play part happened and the pay part did not happen. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, I I started a portal and then got incubated and so on and so forth. So that really what, as a combination of things, triggered me to start something on my own. Mm -hmm. Uh, If I remember correctly, the website you started was something called a quizbrain.com. Who used it at that time in 2000s? We were among the top five in India. And uh, we were the first anything related to education knowledge portal that cost, crossed a million page views. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were the world's first ISO certified quiz portal. So uh, very serious traction happened when we were running quizbrain.com. Mm-hmm. And huge amount of traffic, huge amount of traffic that we used to get. Largely from the US though, in those days, because connectivity there was... Uh, uh, vastly different from what it was in India. Today, that gap is much lesser, but uh, the US browsing experience was very different in those days. Mm-hmm. And how did Quizbrain later become Grey Caps? The dot com bust uh, really meant that the company that incubated me at that time, which was India Info, and um, it was led by a phenomenal man. He's to me one of the pioneers in the internet business. His name is Mahesh. In fact, he started something called Mahesh.com out of the U.S. Uh, Fantastic thinker when it comes to engagement technology. Uh, He was the incubator of this idea. And unfortunately, the parent, which was India Info, uh, which largely was a news-based site, could not sustain. And therefore, it had a fallout effect on Quizbrain. Though, in the entire gamut that we were, Quizbrain was still making its monies, but the monies were with our ground quiz shows and not online. So we were a digital company with zero digital revenue and a lot of brick income that was coming in. But the click was not working for revenues. So when we were told, you know, you've got to downsize and so on. So we actually huddled and we had a thought and I was called one day and told, uh, you got to reduce your team size, you know, by about 70%. And by then we were about eight or nine of us in that team. So I called all of them. We had a meeting and uh, we said, see, we're actually making money. The money may not be sufficient for the eight or nine of us currently to survive. Uh, Especially there were three or four people who were techie among the eight or nine who were keeping the portal alive. So a very conscious decision was taken between the eight, nine of us that the idea is not a bad idea. That the content people would step out and start a company. And uh, the techie guys would join in later because we realized that only the brick side of it was clicking. So mm-hmm. we got back to what would be a traditional quiz model, which was on stage quizzing and so on and so forth, which still continues in a digital era that we are today, still continues uh, to be the mainstay of quizzing in a country like India. Mm-hmm. Um, even as we are in a entering a post-COVID kind of era, We're still trying to figure out how digital quizzing will work. So no one's really got a foolproof agenda as yet on that. But it will evolve. I'm 100% sure that the future of quizzing will be where you will take part from where you are and I will ask questions from where I am. I'm a great believer in that. And very soon, not too far from where we are. 
Yes, and COVID might have accelerated that thought. Uh, who knows? It is, in fact, you know, as a student of change, I don't see COVID as a problem beyond the health problem. COVID, in many ways, and if you ask an optimist like me to interpret something like COVID, I would actually look at COVID as an accelerator. Mm-hmm. COVID has actually served a very big purpose in this world as a digital accelerator. Take, for example, school education in a country like India. With no offense meant to our teachers because they were never required to do anything like that. Most of them did not even know PowerPoint till five months ago or four months ago. They've learned their PowerPoint skills. They did not know what Zoom was, except probably in a camera lens. Today, they are on Zoom, they are on WebEx, they are on Teams, they are on huge number of platforms, extremely competently delivering digital classrooms. Mm -hmm. As I speak to you, my son is in the neighboring room attending school on his laptop. So India has come so far forward, suddenly in 90 days. Who accelerated this? COVID accelerated it. You know, like hurricanes bring you opportunities to change your landscape. Pandemics bring you with it opportunities to adopt new things. And in that sense, I think it's good. Mm-hmm. And circling, circling back to our earlier point about uh, Grey Caps not being just a motor company, and how do you figure out what works and what does not? I have no clue even to this day. I am very honest about it because as I speak to you today, I don't know what my future is as a company. Because we are in two businesses, both of which could be minor question marks. We are on stage shows. I don't know if I'll ever get back on stage one day. Mm -hmm. I reasonably believe I would. But active like before, I don't know. As a company, we were doing about 260, 270 stage shows every year. All quiz masters and great caps put together. Will that ever happen again? I don't know. Will the 270 quizzes therefore become 500 now because of the digital era? Possible, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. We're also into book publishing. Physical books as general knowledge textbooks and curriculum for schools. Will schools necessarily require this kind of printed material in the future or will they adapt to PDFs and so on? I would love to do that. Cost can come down more than anything. Paper need not be used. Mm-hmm. So there's a huge opportunity there. But can mm-hmm. I crystal gaze and put a finger and say, this is the date? I don't think so. Mm-hmm. Which is why I always believe you've got to be open to be a constant learner. If you do not carry that attitude with you in your life, it's extremely difficult because life forces you to unlearn. Mm-hmm. Circumstances of life force you to unlearn. And at that point in time, if you're not willing to learn, you're going to be left behind in that race. The people who survive, it's not, and I'm not a great advocate of this philosophy of the survival of the fittest. Mm-hmm. I strongly believe it is the survival of those who adapt. That mm-hmm. is survival. Fitness has nothing beyond a point, you know. Uh, you, you could be the fittest, but if you're not willing to adapt, you will also become extinct. So in the modern world, I think it's survival based on ability to adapt. Do you think Grey Caps is dependent on the brand Giri? And if so, what what is what are you trying to do to diversify? Uh, I'll give you a mathematical answer for that. Uh, we actually got that... Um, the word perhaps is not tested, but evaluated. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a fantastic company called Equitor. It's headed by a guy called Ramesh Jude Thomas. Mm-hmm. Extraordinary team. Uh, they do valuations of companies and they actually bring out the potential of organizations. And uh, they did a study some years ago when Big Brain was perhaps more the face of the company than it is today. And at that time, the impact of Big Brain to revenue was about 28%. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I would like to believe it's far less today. And therefore, even if you look at the quiz space, we're probably the only quiz company in India or in the world which has modeled ourselves on multiple quiz masters. Yeah. It's not a single quiz master around which a company has evolved. Mm-hmm. Second, 
while we are perceived to be a quizzing company because we're so much in the media and we do shows on television and so on, the quiz part of our business brings us only about 39% of our revenues. It's the publishing side of our business and the content creation part of the business that brings us about 60% of our revenues, which means technically we are a content company and when a person reads my books or our company's books, the pig brain effect is very marginal. Mm -hmm. That's how it should be. To that extent, I'm a great admirer of people like Bill Gates. They've built institutions which can stand tall after their time. The Tatas in India. Mm -hmm. You had tall leaders who you keep thinking you can never replace. Would you have imagined a Jayadi Tata can ever get replaced? Ratan Tata came in. Would you have ever thought a Ratan Tata can be replaced? And then Chandra comes in. So 